Hi everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Lise Lafferty and I work at the Center for Social Research and Health. Um, so before we get started, I just want to do the, the basic housekeeping. So you can see that this is a recorded session. So please be mindful of whatever you say. Please be mindful of what you pop in the chat. I'm not clear on whether or not that gets recorded, but we don't want to find out in an inappropriate way. Um, so please be mindful of all of those things. Also, please keep your microphone on mute. Um, and if you're comfortable, keep your camera on. I think it's probably, I'm not speaking today, but I know when I do speak virtually, it's nicer to actually see a few faces staring back at you rather than just blank screens. Um, and if you have any questions in the chat um, throughout, please pop them into the chat. So I'd like to welcome everyone here today to the CSRH seminar series. I wanna start by acknowledging that we are conducting this seminar on the unceded lands of the Bidjigal people where UNSW sits um, and where I am today. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the elders both past, present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present here today. You may wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that you are currently on, given that you may be located elsewhere throughout Australia or possibly New Zealand. Um, so I invite you to please pop that into the chat. Um, so very exciting talk today. So this presentation is, as I'm sure you've all read in the abstract, it um, will review trends and community attitudes to PrEP, reasons for not using PrEP, and interest in different dosing strategies. Additionally, the speakers will discuss participants' views of treatment, including familiarity with U equals U, and how attitudes to condoms have changed as reliance on PrEP and U equals U has grown. So we have two speakers joining us today, very exciting. James McGibbon is a research associate at the Center for Social Research and Health. He is also the project coordinator of the PREPARE project and the GCPS plus study. Martin Holt is a professor here at CSRH, um, and he leads HIV prevention research at the center, including the PREPARE project and the Gay Community Periodic Surveys. So thank you everyone for joining us today, and I'm now gonna hand over to James. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Lise. Um, so my name is James McGibbon, my pronouns are he and him. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that uh, both Martin and I are joining you from the unceded uh, territory of the Pidgeagle people here on, at the UNSW uh, campus in Kensington. Um, so I'm going to begin this presentation on, uh, present, on results from the PREPARE project from 2021, um, just by going through uh, data from, on key measures. Um, and uh, then we're going to open up the discussion um, afterwards. So you can ask questions and, and um, we can have a yeah, dis discussion of topics that interest you. Um, so I'll probably present for about 30 minutes and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so I'm going to cover, first of all, the study uh, methods, uh, our uh, sample overview. So uh, who we uh, recruited in 2021 uh, and then information on people's sexual practices. So uh, their um, the recent sex with male partners then their use of PEP, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis medication, pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP, and attitudes to PrEP and dosing strategies, attitudes to treatment as prevention, or um, un un undetectable equals untransmissible, U equals U, and then attitudes towards condoms. Uh, and then actually I've got some bonus slides I've put in there, some, um, some uh, attitudes towards different STI prevention strategies. So uh, the PREPARE project uh, is a national online survey of gay and bisexual men. It's been conducted every two years uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, and uh, since uh, 2019 has included also uh, non-binary people um, and an eligibility uh, extends to people who are at least 16 years old. The study was originally designed to assess uh, attitudes to HIV prevention particularly to PrEP and treatment as prevention. And uh, this was to guide implementation for, of PrEP in Australia uh, in the early years when PrEP wasn't available. We have a set of core questions, uh, which have been uh, run every, every two years. Uh, and then we supplement these by additional questions that are relevant uh, at the time of recruitment. 
in uh, 2021, ACON uh, would like to thank for running an excellent uh, campaign uh, to recruit participants. Uh, and uh, most participants were, were recruited uh, via Facebook advertising. Uh, and then uh, via Grinder using um, ad advertising on Grinder. Uh, we also invited participants uh, via direct email if they'd participated in previous years and also had some advertising on Instagram. Um, so moving on to the sample overview. Uh, so here I'm, uh, this slide's comparing uh, so the samples from 2019 and 2021 to look at any changes. Uh, so you'll see that the sample is moderately older with an average age of 38 years in 2021. Uh, most participants identified as gay, but we've had increasing numbers of uh, participants who identify as bisexual or pansexual and also queer. Um, most of the, the participants were born in Australia. There's been no difference in between 2019 and 2021. Uh, on that measure. Also, um, HIV status remains unchanged between the two recruitment rounds uh, and current PrEP use remains stable at around 36 and 37% on in both years. Uh, STI diagnoses you see as the final row uh, fell moderately, uh, which could be reflective of the recruitment um, period and of COVID with uh, potentially less uh, testing or less sexual um, people reporting less sex, so getting tested less frequently. So moving on to uh, who people had sex with, they told us, um, most told us that they had sex with male partners um, and 8% uh, had sex with female partners, 5% with non-binary partners. And um, owing to COVID, nearly half reported that they had fewer sex partners during um, due to the pandemic, 45% um, told us that they had about the same number of partners and 7% had more sex partners. Here I've reported uh, condom of sex over time. So we've got uh, 2011 down here at the beginning and 2022 at the end. Um, looking at uh, across across the whole time period, um, there's been increase in uh, condomless sex uh, among HIV negative and untested unknown participants. Uh, but it's really important to uh, note that that has been concentrated among um, PrEP users. So when we take the, when we take all HIV negative participants, the, the line is quite steep, but when we split the line apart, we have PrEP users up here who report much more um, condomless sex protected by PrEP than uh, other, um, other HIV negative men. Uh, and uh, that's what I've covered. Um, and we've had this fluctuating line uh, among HIV positive men uh, around 50% mark um, from, the, from across the 10 year time period. Moving on to uh, the use of PrEP. Uh, in 2021, half the sample told us that they'd ever used PrEP, which is uh, the highest yet, up from 43% uh, in 2019. Uh, more than a third was taking PrEP at the time of the survey, but again, this uh, remained uh, steady since the last recruitment round in 2019. And uh, one quarter of participants had ever taken PEP, which is the, uh, the orange line. Uh, yeah. Now in this slide, we're looking at uh, how people are taking PrEP. So I've divided this, uh, these options as daily pills, event-based dosing, periodic dosing, and then other ways to take PrEP medication. Um, and in the, the colors represent the years. So in uh, 2017, 98% of people were taking PrEP uh, daily, uh, and then as time has gone on from uh, 2017 to 2019, that fell slightly, and then we saw a, a very uh, a marked difference between 2019 and 2021, uh, where the uh, proportion of people taking daily pills has 
decreased and that has been uh, supplemented by people taking event-based um, taking prep on demand or event-based dosing. So this is quite an interesting way of uh, looking at how dosing strategies or, or the ways that people will take prep um, have changed over time. We have only started to ask more recently about periodic dosing. Um, and uh, so that therefore that number is uh, only represented in uh, 2021. Uh, so also good to note that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to move on there. Uh, this this uh, this uh, slide uh, represents uh, two scales that we have used in uh, the prepare project. First of all, there's willingness to use prep, and then concern about using prep. So the scores here uh, uh, de they're derived from a uh, number of measures that in, uh, that measure each of those um, constructs of willingness and concern. Separate separate scales. And over time, we've seen uh, that uh, concern has decreased, uh, which is great. And that, uh, that willingness has increased moderately over time, but it's really uh, pl plateaued between the last uh, couple of years. And it's also worth noting that this group of people that um, has, has also shrunk so as more and more people, these, these questions about willingness to use PrEP are asked of people who have never taken PrEP. And as that group of people has gotten a lot smaller over, um, over the recent years, there are less people that, um, that are not using PrEP that are responding to this, um, this item. Now, here we have uh, a PrEP cascade, which uh, we developed, um, well, Martin and his team developed a few years ago. Uh, and then we have updated this um, this year to, uh, to include recent data. So here we have uh, data again from three years, 2017 being in blue, uh, 2019 in orange and 2021 in um, purple. Uh, now, what we are looking at here in the first step is the proportion of, uh, of non-HIV positive participants who we classified as eligible to take PrEP. And this is based on approximation of uh, the criteria in prescribing guidelines. Um, and then we're looking at, uh, as, as we go down the cascade, looking at uh, potential uh, barriers to uptake. So whether or not those participants are aware that PrEP is available, then willingness to use PrEP, whether they have discussed it with a doctor, whether they would ever used it, uh, whether they were currently using PrEP. And then what we've added in the last uh, two steps are kind of a, a, a alternative to quality of life type um, items, which would have in a perhaps a um, HIV uh, treatment cascade. So it's whether uh, those participants had been recently tested for HIV and STIs, and then whether they had uh, reduced HIV concern or increased uh, confidence owing to PrEP. I'll, and I'll just saw that question from Anthony. I think I'll be able to answer that in the next slide. Um, so uh, what is good to note here um, is that the biggest gap, um, so, well, first of all, that there's been improvement on all um, all steps of the cascade over time. So we've seen that uh, the gaps between uh, each of these steps has narrowed, but the biggest gap that remains has stayed between awareness of PrEP and willingness to use PrEP. And then um, the other thing to note is that um, 63% of PrEP suitable participants were using PrEP in uh, 2021. There's more detail on this cascade in our report. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to um, have a look there or let me know if you have any specific questions afterwards. So I uh, hope that this might get to 
some of the questions that Anthony was asking um, about uh, PrEP naive participants. So here they're PrEP naive participants that have never used PrEP, but uh, people that we've classified as uh, suitable to take PrEP. And I've got more information on them in the next slide. Um, so among these participants, the most common reasons for not using PrEP were not being comfortable talking to a doctor, not having enough sex, concern about side effects, not knowing how to get PrEP, concerns about long-term medication, and that they were using condoms. Uh, among these same participants, the most preferred ways to take PrEP were event-based dosing, monthly pills, long-acting injections, then daily pills and implants. So these were all potential, you know, hypothetical ways that, um, that might be possible to take PrEP, noting that they're not um, available necessarily uh, at the moment or, or not necessarily found to be uh, uh, effective for um, use. So again, uh, looking at these PrEP suitable people, we wanted to know um, if, there, if any particular groups were overrepresented or underrepresented and uh, yeah, what stood out. Now, first of all, I guess to note, uh, this is a fairly uh, small uh, group. So it's uh, just less than 200 people. Um, most were born in Australia. So we didn't see that um, any particular group of people born overseas were overrepresented in, in uh, this um, breakdown. Uh, we did see that there were 35% uh, of uh, this group were under 30 years old, which is slightly higher than we had expected. So we'd say that younger people are overrepresented in um, this group of PrEP suitable participants. 7% did not have Medicare coverage. 66% uh, were gay, which is uh, less than the overall um, the, the overall proportion of, for the sample. Uh, so, and therefore the 29% who said that they identify as bisexual uh, was a larger proportion. So bisexual participants were overrepresented in this group. And lastly, uh, nearly 90% of this uh, group who were uh, PrEP eligible and, and had, were not taking PrEP uh, said that they were having condomless sex. Uh, and 30% had had an STI diagnosis in the previous year. So moving on to uh, reasons for stopping PrEP, uh, which is, uh, these are uh, items we ask of people who, uh, who have told us that they were previously taking PrEP and that they had stopped um, either temporarily or permanently. And that was uh, 143 people in uh, 2021. Uh, most common reasons were having less sex, being in a uh, monogamous relationship, followed by concern about taking medication, stopping because of COVID, uh, and then that they uh, believe they were no longer at risk of HIV, that they couldn't afford it, or that they were having uh, side effects from the medication. Um, also worth noting here that uh, between, we also asked these questions in 2019, it was a much smaller group uh, then, uh, which I think, you know, as time goes on, more people have, uh, have stopped prep, so that makes sense. Um, but the, this order of reasons has not changed between uh, the two rounds. Now here uh, we're looking at the preferred ways uh, to take prep. So the, the um, looking at all uh, non-HIV non positive participants, and I've divided these participants by whether they use PrEP currently or they don't. Um, and then uh, we're looking at hypothetically what would be their most preferred uh, way to take PrEP. Um, now, what's really interesting here is that there are differences between the current PrEP users and the non-PrEP users in their preferred ways to take PrEP. There's uh, similar levels of interest in monthly pills at 31%, but then PrEP users are much more likely to prefer long-acting injections, 29% compared to 21% of non-PrEP users. And then uh, non-PrEP users are more likely to prefer event-based dosing compared to PrEP users, 23 uh, compared to 
Uh, and then PrEP users preferred uh, daily pills over, um, sorry, they preferred daily pills uh, more than uh, non-PrEP users and uh, then long-acting removable pill implants about the same um, between both groups. So I think this is uh, really interesting because it shows that perhaps uh, the type of messaging uh, that could uh, help uh, talk to people who uh, aren't taking PrEP that might benefit from it, um, that the types of ways to take PrEP might be different um, for people who have, haven't yet taken PrEP uh, compared to people who are already taking PrEP. So it's good to take uh, to take their preferences into account rather than to assume that people who are not currently taking PrEP might want to take it in a similar way to people who are already taking it. Um, so moving on to another of our um, scales uh, we've been using, uh, since 2017, we have uh, reduced HIV concern from PrEP, which uh, is asked in two different ways for, so first of all, uh, in red um, for HIV negative and untested unknown um, status participants who have never taken PrEP. Uh, so the reduced HIV concern from PrEP has increased in that group um, between 2017 and 2021. Uh, and then in the blue line we've got current and recent PrEP users where reduced average concern from PrEP has fluctuated a little between 2017 uh, going down in 2019 and then back up again in 2021. Um, but overall uh, among both groups these are um, significant increases when uh, controlling for sampling. Now, um, these items are new for, for the 2021 uh, survey. So we asked uh, participants uh, about U equals U or undetectable equals and transmissible in three different ways. First of all, we asked people how familiar they were with the U equals U message. And then people who had heard of it uh, in any way at all were asked how accurate they believe the message was. and um, all participants were asked whether they would have sex without condoms with a HIV positive person who is undetectable. And here we've created a cascade um, showing uh, the proportions of people who uh, were familiar uh, with U equals U, nearly 80%, um, and 70% believed it was accurate, and 40% were willing to rely on U, U equals U. Um, now, in the next slide, I'm going to show that these um, these uh, items that we had quite quite striking differences between uh, between different groups. So uh, you'll see here that uh, there is much much higher uh, familiarity with U equals U, which comes as no surprise among HIV positive participants, ninety six percent and ninety one percent believe that it was accurate. 86% were willing to rely on U equals U. And then we have PrEP users in the um, sort of darkish teal green line, uh, which were the next, high, the, the, the next group to report the highest levels of familiarity and belief in U, U equals U. Um, and then willingness to rely on it uh, reduced uh, somewhat. And uh, I mean, it, I, don't want to read into that too much, but I uh, could hazard a guess that this might be due to participants uh, taking PrEP, um, believing that, that their PrEP use is what they're relying on rather than uh, their trust in their partner's, um, their partner's status or undetectability. Um, but again, we, we, don't, um, we don't know from these data. Um, now, in the next uh, columns, we have HIV negative participants who are not on PrEP, um, and uh, we have lower levels across the three measures, and then much lower uh, levels across the three measures among people who have not been uh, tested for HIV uh, or don't, don't know their status.
we've also been asking participants uh, about belief in uh, that early HIV treatment is necessary. It's another um, scale. Um, so these scores are derived from multiple items. Uh, over time, um, we've seen that on, on both of the measures, there's been increases, um, oh, sorry, on, on among both uh, HIV positive uh, men, but also HIV negative untested unknown men, that the, the uh, proportions have increased. Um, and uh, these uh, increased since uh, 2019 um, among uh, HIV positive participants when controlling uh, the sampling. Uh, moving on to uh, experiences of condoms, uh, we see that uh, in both groups, uh, the proportions of participants who report positive experience using condoms is quite low and has halved among um, HIV negative untested unknown participants uh, in the past 10 years from 10 to 5%. Uh, and it's plummeted to, <laughs> plummeted to 1% in uh, 2021 among HIV positive participants. Um, there were no significant changes, however, among uh, both groups when controlling sampling um, since 2019. We've been asking participants as well uh, items from so it's another scale item, scale um, with multiple items that uh, about confidence discussing condoms. Uh, over time, uh, we've seen that confidence discussing condoms has decreased among uh, both groups um, uh, and is lower was lower among HIV positive participants than HIV negative uh, and unknown or untested. Um, participants. Now looking at um, STIs in the previous 12 months, 67% uh, of the sample had been tested for STIs and 22% had been diagnosed with an STI. Most common STIs that people were diagnosed with were chlamydia followed by uh, gonorrhea and then I um, would say syphilis. Uh, which is not on this slide. Um, we asked people in 2021 um, how acceptable different STI prevention strategies would be to them. Now, uh, first of all, the caveat that we put to uh, participants was that uh, these uh, might not be efficacious, they might not work. Um, so, we wanted to know if people were interested in these um, these different strategies, despite knowing that perhaps they, they uh, weren't going to be promoted by public health. Um, so first of all, condoms, about half the sample said uh, that they, um, that was acceptable. Uh, we know that condoms reduce risk, but don't eliminate STI risk. Uh, we also asked about uh, regular low-dose low antibiotics, um, which is sometimes called STI PrEP. Um, so STI PrEP might reduce bacterial STIs, but of course there are concerns about antibiotic resistance and also uh, gastrointestinal issues. Um, and this uh, method or strategy is currently being studied in Australia, which is one of the reasons why we're interested. Uh, so that's the Australian uh, syphilaxis study. We asked about a single antibiotic pill after sex, uh, which might be called STI-PEP. Um, and that has been tried under uh, Ipigay and Doxypep studies um, and results were released at the AIDS 22 conference, I believe. Um, that, and those results showed that um, the STI PEP may reduce uh, bacterial STIs. Um, next, we asked, so on that, actually 70% uh, of the sample said that uh, that strategy was acceptable to them. Um, we also asked about uh, ga gargling mouthwash, sorry. Um, and we thought that, well, the, the research community thought that this might be a plausible strategy, but it's a in fact, been uh, shown to be ineffective. 
for memory, one would need to gargle a lot of mouthwash for a very long period of time for it to work. And it turns out most people can't do that. Um, but it was quite an acceptable strategy for people. Uh, and then we also asked about douching after sex, um, which uh, has been historically a, a popular um, option, uh, or thought to be, um, but can actually increase risk of STIs. So um, kind of glad to see that uh, that is not so acceptable. So here I'd just like to signal what other items we have um, from the surveys and uh, what, uh, what you might find in the report or uh, you can contact us about. Uh, so we've been asking about attitudes to other people using PrEP, um, particularly support for uh, gay and bisexual men using PrEP and willingness to have sex with PrEP users. Um, we asked in 2021 about preferences for HIV treatment dosing in a similar way to uh, the PrEP dosing strategies, but we only based those items on uh, things that we thought might uh, be available in coming years. Um, so you'll find uh, those results in the report. Uh, we asked about alcohol and other drug use, uh, relationships with male and female partners and relationship agreements. We asked about um, use of different prevention strategies and perceived effectiveness and acceptability of different prevention strategies. So just to summarize um, all what I've talked about already, half the sample were having less sex due to COVID-19. Uh, recent PrEP use was sustained at about uh, at around 36 to 37 percent between 2019 and 2021. There was an increase in event-driven uh, PrEP dosing to 18% in 2021. Willingness to use PrEP was stable at 32% and concern about PrEP uh, was at 35% in 2021. Barriers to PrEP included not wanting to talk to a doctor, not having enough sex, concern about side effects and medication or taking, taking medication. Uh, younger um, bisexual and pansexual men are overrepresented among PrEP suitable participants. Uh, stopping PrEP was associated with less sex and um, monogamous relationships. There was strong interest in alternative dosing strategies, so uh, event-driven um, on-demand PrEP or monthly pills and long-acting injections. Belief in uh, treatment as prevention and awareness of uh, U equals U has improved, but remains concentrated among HIV positive participants and PrEP users. Uh, confidence discussing condoms with partners has fallen, but stabilized uh, during 2019 and 2021. And uh, I'd just like to also acknowledge um, all the participants who completed questionnaires. Uh, the current and former members of the Prepare Project Reference Group, and also like to acknowledge our funders. So during uh, 2015 to 2021, the Prepare Project was supported by the, um, the Breeze Program funded by New South Wales Ministry of Health. Uh, Prepare is also supported by surveillance funding from the Australian Government Department of Health. And just... Uh, Martin has shared the direct link to download the report in the chat, but um, here's what it looks like when you get there. You can also head to our website if you want to jot that down, if you can't follow the link right now. So I think we could open up, we've got... Find Thank you so much, time. James, that was wonderful. Thank you. So we've got 25 minutes or so, or we can wrap up, have an early mark. We can do questions at least for 15 minutes, I think. Does I, was anyone have... I was doing a lot of Q and A in, in that while you were while you were talking, James, as well. Do people have any other comments or questions they wanted to raise? Hi, Anthony, go ahead. So 
sorry, I didn't uh, unmute myself. Um, I was curious about uh, any sort of prep sorting or if, if there were any measures on, on that. So amongst people who are not using prep, um, whether they're relying on partners being on prep and, and any of those kinds of dynamics. Um, we don't ask specifically about prep sorting as such, but we do um, in other analyses, uh, we're able to infer prep sorting in a way because, so, so but only in the event that people have had uh, condomless sex um, with a casual partner, what we do is look at the different um, things that they did to reduce risk. Um, if they told us they'd had condomless sex, one of those items is um, I was taking prep or my part, I checked that my partner was taking prep, um, something along those lines. So then we uh, use those items to infer whether or not they might have been um, prep sorting, but it's not a direct um, question. Um, so we're not asking people if they're being selective about who they have sex with based on their prep use as such. That's, yeah, that's true. And also in the periodic surveys um, that saying your partner was um, reporting condom sex and saying your partner was on prep has become more common over time. It's, it's more obvious in both studies, whether people are using it exclusively or preferentially, we don't ask, but it has become more common. Um, yeah, the saying your partner is on prep and reporting condom sex in both studies has become more common and also, and then to a lesser extent, saying your partner's undetectable and having condom sex has become more common as well, but not as obviously. I have a question. I have two questions. <laughs> um, I, and I, I feel like I heard an urban legend that that PrEP was going to become available for people without Medicare. Did I hear that or no? Oh, well, it's lucky we've got Anthony here because aren't you the PrEP regulation guy? Um, so I haven't heard, I think there's discussion about making it available to people who are Medicare ineligible mm -hmm. because it's a gap. And it, James has done an analysis before that shows that among people who, so he's shown you some stuff here about people who look like they're suitable for PrEP and not taking it. And he's done a different analysis earlier, which was people who look like, who say they want to take PrEP, but aren't currently using it. And Medicare ineligible guys are overrepresented in that group. So there has been a bit of a discussion about, because they're a pretty small group of people, usually overseas born, recently arrived whether we can get them uh, better access to PrEP um, if they don't have a full Medicare card. Anthony, do you have a view about like whether it's just going to become more, I don't think it's going to become free, is it? Um, yeah, I don't know if I've heard anything. I mean, uh, people who are HIV positive um, who don't have Medicare, um, that's that's recently changed. I mean, states were in some states were informally doing that before, but it's now um, federal, so there might be a precedent based on that. But it would be um, valuable. But yeah, I haven't unless there's something behind the scenes that you've heard, but I haven't heard anything. I heard there was a there was a repurposing of some. So when some of the PrEP studies that were used to show that PrEP was safe and that people would come forward and take it were wrapping up and we got the public listing in 2018, some of those studies carried on in a form targeted at overseas born people who didn't have Medicare. That certainly was the case in New South Wales and might have been the case in Victoria as well. Um, my PrEP, you know, me PrEP, Medicare ineligible PrEP, um, I actually can't tell you whether that study is still running or not. Somebody else who's on the line might know. Um, but yes, I one of the, I think one of the issues that's interesting is that you know the number of people living with HIV in Australia is uh, relatively small. And so even with um, people uh, moving here from overseas who might get diagnosed, um, a really good case was made. We can afford to do this, like for people who are diagnosed, because it's um, small numbers, and we want everybody to be on treatment if they're living with HIV, if they want to be on treatment. Um, obviously, I think the general rule is that you have to kind of, for a prevention strategy, you have to cover like ten times more people. Um, 
as a guesstimate, um, Martin Chell's epidemiology without being one. Um, you know, so you can imagine that there might be uh, much, but with people who are Medicare ineligible, it wouldn't be that many people. It would be a good thing. Well, let's see what happens in, in the run up to AIDS 20, um, the IAS conference in Brisbane next year. Governments are usually pressured to announce something positive uh, in the run up. That would be a good thing for them to announce. Oh, I'm sorry, I can see some questions coming in as well. Lamin's confirming it's not um, free yet for Medicare ineligible people. But yes, agreeing on the advocacy point. Alex is asking, read the willingness to rely on you equals you question. Have you considered asking a question in future that differentiates concern about STIs from potential HIV stigma? Um, I not considering STI risk, are you willing to have criminal sex with a partner with UVI? I mean, that's possible. Uh, Alex, I would generally say that based on research I've done and other people have done, um, perception of HIV risk is always considered much more significant than STI risk. So it is a factor in people's decision. We can see in this sample, um, selling the STI prevention data, that um, preference to use condoms appears to be higher among people who are a bit more concerned about STIs. That's right, James, isn't it, in that analysis? Yeah, the, the, the preference your concern about STIs and condom use are kind of a bit more associated with each other, which makes sense. But um, I think the, the the belief in treatment as prevention and the comfort with U equals U stuff consistently for mm, at least 10 years shows a real, really sort of strong, I mean, you might call it fear, um, or stigma about HIV, or at least caution about HIV, where people, when we put that scenario to them, have condom sex with someone who's HIV positive and undetectable. I think what tends to happen is they just start thinking about the HIV positive bit, and they're like going, I wouldn't go out of my way to have sex with someone who's HIV positive without condoms. And yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, we've seen massive improvement in those measures, but not across the board. Um, and you can see even with the PrEP users, there's some reticence there. They're kind of generally the most positive group aside from people living with HIV about U equals U. And uh, what was the phrase that Kane Race used at the conference? And they're double glove, you know, they're on PrEP uh, and they know more about undetectability as well. So it is possible that we could try and differentiate that or we could look the other way around is to look at people who look concerned about um, or don't believe in U equals U and see if their concern about STIs is higher. That's something we look at as well. James, that's something for us to know. If we write up the U equals U data is where the concern about STIs is a thing in there. I was curious about the inclusion of uh, 16, 17 year olds, because that was fairly recent. Has that produced anything different? Is there much in that group or has that produced much differently for the survey? It's a very small group. So uh, no, uh, it's a short answer. Those um, inclusion of those participants don't influence the results as such, but uh, we think it's an important, um, it's an important change just to reflect the age of um, consent for sex in um, Australian jurisdictions uh, to give people who are aged 16, 17 the option to participate in research that's about them and that might influence uh, their uh, policies that affect them. Um, so, yeah, it, it's quite a small group. It's also possible that because of the way we uh, recruit participants um, that uh, we don't quite reach them. Uh, we're not sure about how our content on Meta's platforms, so Facebook and Instagram is visible uh, to people under the age of 18. Could be that it is um, restricted and we don't know about it because we have words in there that might um, be suggested of sexual health content. Um, and then uh, we'd anticipate that 16 and 17 year olds are not using Grindr, but I'm not sure about that. 
there's also the Facebook aging platform problem as well. Um, recruiting, but we thought it was really important. We were pushed by partners to include 16 and 17 year olds because of age of consent. And we totally agree with that. Um, I think it's probably at least sustained the proportion of younger people in the study, which is good. And they do consistently show up as, you know, age is a key factor with, you know, willingness to use and actual likelihood of using PrEP, for example. So younger men are generally less likely to be using it. But they also tend to report less sex than their older peers, um, guys in the 30s and 40s. Um, there was a, I, I just briefly respond to a comment about sexual health clinics being able to help recruit 16, 17 year olds. That is true. We have agreement. Uh, it's it's quite difficult to do research with uh, under 18s and our agreement with uh, ethics uh, oversight is that we will not be contacting uh, people uh, directly if they're minors. Um, so it's uh, so they're able to um, self-select to participate online, uh, where they're able to easily um, choose to stop participating at any point. Um, so yeah, we could use a QR code for sure, um, but yeah, we can't approach people directly uh, if they're minors at the moment. Anybody have a question for us? I'd really like to try TikTok um, advertising. I think we might get there on another study next year, perhaps, we'll see. Um, but we have a lot to learn um, as academics who are not of the TikTok age um, about how that will work. So we're, yeah, we're actively looking at um, options um, and we'll apply that back to prepare, I think, um, yes. It's an interesting one because I think you have to have participate enough on the platform with TikTok in order to actually set up an advertising platform. So you have to have a certain number of followers and we didn't start there on Prepare. Prepare has a Facebook following of sorts. Um, you know, and it takes time and effort, but you know, we have colleagues who are experimenting with that, who with a view to, um, oh, okay, this is popping up. You don't need a minimum number of followers for business account. Oh yes, of course, because they'll take your money. Of course they will. Um, well, okay, well, if we're still doing it, James, next year. You can take that one on. We'll await that seminar. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, I think a, re a recruitment um, for sexual health studies, like woes kind of seminar would be really helpful. <laughs> how, how can we uh, promote sexual health content these days with censorship on internet and whatnot. That's a really tough one, um, but, you know, an interesting problem to tackle over the next year or so for us. We should um, acknowledge, because we mentioned in passing that we asked ACON to help us during COVID to do recruitment for this, which seems like quite a long time ago, because we'd had a purple patch with there with online advertising. And we actually, this project was really difficult advertising last year. I think people were very tired. There was a, everything was pushed online. And um, Facebook, some of you may realize Facebook, Instagram being linked had changed its targeting restrictions online. So it, was, it had become even more difficult to target people based on sexual orientation or sexual health. Lots of adverts get stopped if they're, too, if they're perceived as too explicit or targeting a minority, even if a number of you are from the minority and they're targeting them for a legitimate reason. So it becomes um, quite difficult in that context to recruit for these studies. And people have mentioned clinics recruitment. You'll be aware that also clinic recruitment traditionally is even more governed. So you need specific approval to recruit through clinics as well. And that's often you're talking about a small number of people, it's actually extremely uh, time consuming to get the, to get the approval uh, for a small number of people who might passively see adverts and take part. 
I mean, we've already all, always done this study online because it was more nimble, but it was quite it was quite hard last year. So we are very grateful for Acon's social media team helping us with that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to do it. I'm going to cash in on that early mark that James suggested earlier. And thank you both so much for, for the presentation today, James, and for, for fielding the Q&A throughout the discussion and after Martin. It was very interesting. Thank you. No worries. Thank you for sharing. Cheers, virtual, virtual applause. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lise, and thank thanks, you. everyone, for joining. Uh, please follow up with an email if you have any questions.